Well, hi, everyone. This has been a while. I hope you are able to join us today. I'm here with Coach Diana. We haven't been here for a while. So we would love to hear from you that you are taking some time out of your busy set schedule tonight. I know, I know. I was at Costco today, too. It is crazy out there. <laughs> It is crazy out there. And if you're getting ready for Thanksgiving, I am truly humbled that you have taken some time out of your time to be with us today. But if you're here, could you just give us a shout out and let us know that you're here? Because that helps me to know that we are actually live. That helps us to know that um, we have actual viewers. Um, I did a Facebook Live. Diana, I'm hearing a lot of feedback from you or me. One of us is, I don't know who it's from, but do you hear it? It sounds like a lot of actual I don't. Hi, T. Tell me if you're hearing a lot of feedback and echoing so that I'm hearing it. Let, so me, I don't know. Mute. let me mute and see if it's me. Okay. So let me, I, I, yeah, I think it is you because I don't hear it now. So I'm not sure if you can turn down your volume a little bit. Yes, you are hearing. So are you still hearing it? I, I'm not hearing it now on my end. Diana went mute on her end. Yes, I'm welcome. 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 I'm glad you're here. I hear the feedback. Okay. So are you hearing it right now? Let me know if you're hearing, giving you some new feedback because Diana went, um, are you still hearing it now? Gone now. Okay. Yeah, it's gone. So um, let, let's turn Diane's feedback back on or your microphone back on and see if we're hearing it. All right, Diana, talk. Hello, I'm here and I'm happy to be here with you, hopefully without feedback. Okay. Are you hearing that now? It sounds good now. Good. I think it was just weird at the beginning. All right. I'm glad for that. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm not hearing it now. I am hearing a little bit of it, but I'm not sure what it sort of almost sounds like bubbles in the background or something. So I don't think so. No feedback. Sounds good now. Okay. I don't know. I'm, I must, my ears must be hypersensitive. I'm hearing it again. So I'm not sure what what's going on. Anyway. <laughs> Welcome as we get our tech together here. We're going to be talking about what is the difference between a difficult season and a destructive pattern. So what we do with our Facebook Lives is we invite you to answer that question and then we'll interact with you about that. How would you define the difference between a difficult season in a marriage or in a relationship and a destructive pattern? How would you define that? Hi, everyone. I see some familiar faces. Define that for us. What's the difference between a difficult season in marriage or in a relationship, in a family, a friendship, and a destructive pattern? Some of you are well-versed in our conversations, and so give us your knowledge. I see people still popping in. Mm -hmm. Hello from Canada. So Evelyn is saying destructive is all the time. A season might be a new issue. Okay, so let me let me just give you a scenario, Evelyn. If you're if you're struggling with a special needs child all the time, would that be difficult or would that be destructive? Okay, so Sonia says destructive is we never see any repentance. Okay, so that would be a red flag that whatever's going wrong is over and over and over again, the same thing. That would be the destructive pattern, right? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a destruct? Mandy says it's both for me. What's the difference though? Because I think it's really important that we use our language as best we can to create clarity, right? Because clarity, clarity helps us know what we need to do, what's the next steps. And so if we have clarity on what's really wrong, like I, I, I had a spider bite, um, I don't know if Diana, you knew, but I, got, I remember that. Yeah, I got a bad spider bite at our staff retreat, and I thought it was a scorpion bite, but it turned out to be a brown recluse bite. Oh, now I don't know the difference. I wouldn't probably recognize a brown recluse spider if I saw it, but the damage is very different, and the medicine is important so that you get what you need. And words are important. And labeling things correctly is important, right? And so how would you, so Teresa is saying controlling and manipulative. Those All right, so what would that be difficult or would that be destructive? Would that 
be difficult or destructive? All right, Teresa says, yeah, controlling and manipulative is destructive and difficult is not going to the holiday maybe you wanted to go to, right? So difficult is not getting the job you wanted, losing a job that you wanted, having some crisis in your life that's new but hard. Ellen's saying, in a destructive marriage, issues are never really resolved, and the repentance isn't complete. Okay. Mary Catherine says that, for me, I think it comes down to their attentions behind their behavior. Mm -hmm. so, so that's interesting. So if I didn't intend to hurt you, but I did, but I did. What would be the difference response between a destructive person or a healthy person? So if I crashed into your car and I didn't intend to do it, it was an accident, how would a healthy person respond so that that would be a difficult season of getting your car fixed or getting your body fixed versus a destructive one? What would be the difference? Michelle says apologetic, okay. Mm -hmm. So if I crashed into your car, I'm gonna play I'm gonna play the devil's advocate here because I really want you guys to learn to think for yourself. That's one of my goals this year. It's not just to get you to hear me think through things. I want you to think through things. So if I crash into your car and you were a church yeah. friend of mine and I jumped out of the car and I said, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to crash into your car, stupid me. I was just not paying attention. I own it. I'm so sorry. Thank you for forgiving me. Be well. Goodbye. I'll drive off. Is that difficult? Or is that something else? All right. Ellen says, restitution is made. Yeah. So even when we don't intend to hurt someone, we care that we did. It matters. Yes, Mary Catherine saying a healthy person would show empathy and remorse and try to repent and fix their part. So when you don't see that, and that's a pattern that you don't see in this relationship, that might be one of your red flags that that's a difference between disappointing or difficult season and destructive. Diana, you talk for a minute because I'm hearing that pattern and I think it's on my end. So you talk a little bit. Okay. Um, well, I think um, Mary Catherine's had a good word here, um, which for me is pivotal, is fixing their part. Um, it's one thing to say that you're sorry and um, to show caring but now what, now what do I do? How do I make it okay? What does ownership and responsibility on my end to fix it look like? And I think often that is something that you can look for when it's a difficult situation. Whereas what might it look like if someone showed up and didn't own their piece? and was destructive in that. What might that look like? I'm, I know we have some terms that we use for what happens in those situations, but I don't wanna feed you all the answers. So, I mean, what are some things that people do when they may seem like they own their behavior and they may apologize, but there's no fixing? Yeah. Matt Forward is saying, my husband would say, I'm sorry, I had to hurt you. Yeah, had to. Wow. Wow, and had. I, hmm. And I had to hurt you because why? I had to hurt you because you weren't willing to do what I wanted you to do, right? right. So there's this element of control. That's different. Difficult is not controlling over. Difficult is you know, you like, you like pasta and I like gluten-free and it's figure, difficult to figure out how to cook together, right? Difficult mm -hmm. is having a child that's got special needs and we have very different parenting styles and that's a difficult parenting situation. 
that's difficult, but we respect and honor each other. We don't put each other down, but we deal with difficult. It's a season of difficult. We disagree on how to spend money. That's difficult, but we both have a voice, right? I know Ellen is um, Ellen is saying blame shifting. That's huge. Um, turning the blame on someone else is not owning. It's it's there's no repair there. That is a destructive pattern. And what can you do with someone who has that destructive pattern when they blame shift? What are you left with? Depends on you. Right, depends on you what you're left with. Because if you take all the blame, they may give it all to you, but if you take it all, then how does that shift your story? Right? So I think this is what we're really getting at is that one of the most important things, if you wanna change the destructive or even difficult dynamics in your life, whatever they might be, whether it's just your own self with yourself or your own self with someone else. Because we are, I don't know about you, but I argue with my own self about stuff. You know, like I, there's a couple different sides of me <laughs> and it depends on who's gonna win. You know, there's a side of me that is lazy and there's a side of me that's cranky and there's a side of me that doesn't want to um, work hard and there's a side of me that overworks and works too hard, right? And so, so there's all kinds of sides of me and some of that can be destructive. Like even, even a side of me that doesn't take care of me. Like I had to be almost arm twisted to go to the doctor about my leg. That's because nobody, you know, and I could say the reason, I mean, I was never taken care of as a child. And so I just tough, toughened up and it's okay. And I can do it and no big deal until I'm getting, go to the doctor, go to the doctor go to the doctor about my leg. And finally I said, you know, maybe I should go to the doctor. <laughs> um, so I think there's sometimes a lack of self-care in our own self, yeah. a lack of honoring our own self. And so we're more easily willing to tolerate destructive behavior. And even, and I'm just going to make this silly about the spider, but it was pretty destructive to my leg. And I'm going to show you a picture because this is, this showed me something about me that I just had to pay attention to. So I was willing to live with this on my leg. Oh, and that's the, it got worse. Oh, much worse, yes. And, oh, it was and traveling with your leg when you sent me the picture. Yes, yes. and, and my, my family and my friends are going, go to the doctor. So, so this is difficult. <clears throat> it was a difficult thing getting bit by a spider, but my own response to it was actually destructive to me because I wasn't taking good care of me. I was just putting cream on it. I was taking aspirin. I think, oh, it's nothing. It's just, you know, scorpion. I looked it up. It's fine. But it really wasn't that. It was far worse than that. And so I think sometimes we can minimize or we don't take care of us. And so I'm just sharing that very recent story because until I was willing to face what it might be and get the help I needed, now my leg's not great, but it's better. It doesn't look like that anymore. It just looks smaller, but it's, it's still two weeks later, it's still pretty serious. Right. And so those are the things that we want to teach you to honor yourself. Like when something's happened to you that's destructive or difficult, how are you handling mm -hmm. that? How do you, you show up? It happens. Yeah. I love what you said, because there, if you've been in a marriage where there has been a consistent destructive pattern. That doesn't mean there's not also difficult seasons on top of that. But when you've been doing it for a long time, you may not even be aware that there's a lack of ability for you to care for yourself, to use your voice. Yeah. That's powerful. So awareness is key. Mm -hmm. And so part of our goal here is just having this dialogue because sometimes we're not aware until someone else says so. And, you know, I wasn't aware. I mean, I could look at my leg and I could, I mean, I, obviously if I was bleeding and it was hurting a whole lot, I would have done something, but it wasn't, it was just getting uglier and uglier. And so I needed the feedback of other people to say, this doesn't look good. This is more serious than you think. This is, this is destructive to your body. And so I think this is where I love 
having these Facebook lives. I love having our workshops. We're having one coming up soon because in the sense of community, maybe what we think is normal, what we think is something we should tolerate, we hear from others around us that no, we shouldn't tolerate it. That's not normal. It's destructive. It's dangerous. It's harmful. And we need to do something different. If you did something different, so here's where I, we're going to do a workshop in two weeks from Thursday, two weeks from Thanksgiving. So not this, no, two weeks from tonight, tomorrow. It's not at a Thursday, it's Tuesday. We change it to Tuesday. It's two weeks from tomorrow. So December 5th, you know how we do some workshops a couple times a year. So we're going to do a workshop in preparation for our new year. And the workshop is change your story, change your life, change your story, change your life. Because the decisions you make when something happens to you, like the decisions I made about my leg, affect you. I, I can't decide whether I'm going to get bit by a spider or not. That was not under my control. But what I did about that was under my control. And I was being passive. <laughs> and I was being indifferent to my own self. And maybe I could have gotten a very serious infection that it could have cost me you know, surgery or could have cost me other things in my leg if I didn't take action. So we can be agents in our own story. And that's our goal to teach you how to do this in this workshop so that destructive patterns or difficult seasons don't finish the story in a bad way, that you can take action in your own story and create different outcomes, just like I did with my leg. Once I started taking medication, I've got a different outcome than I would have had had I kept ignoring it, ignoring it, ignoring it, then I might have had a much more serious problem to take care of. And a lot of our women ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, thinking that this is godly forbearance, that we are putting up with someone and that's what we should do as a godly woman, as a godly wife. When in fact, maybe we should call it what it is, toxic. Right? So I'm going to give you the link that you can sign up for this workshop. We're just opening it out today for the first time. So if you're interested in this workshop, we want to show you how to sign up. It's the same link we usually use, join workshop. Uh, LeslieVernick.com, join workshop. And it's the workshop on change your story, change your life. It happens on December 5th, which is Tuesday. We have the same times, noon Eastern time, 730 Eastern time. Same pro process, we have a whole handout for you. But I think the new year for me is always a time to reevaluate. Like, where have I been this year? What areas have I grown in? What areas did I get stuck in? What do I want my new year to look like? How do I, I kind of see the page turning. So it's 2023. Now we're writing the chapter of 2024. What do I want that story to look like? Do you have those feelings on New Year's, Diana, where you just want to turn a new page? I do. I want, yeah, because we want to continue growing. We want everything to be different, to be better. We want to reflect on what we were doing that hasn't worked, right? Um, or um, maybe what we want to do more of. Absolutely. And yeah. I think it's a good time to get quiet, settle in, and make some changes. So we want to do this for you early in December because I know it's going to get crazy later in December, and it's hard to think for yourself and about yourself during that time. But if we do it early in December, maybe you can spend a little time the first week and two to just reflect on God in you, God with you, God for you, as we think about the birth of Jesus. And what is it that he's called you to be? Mm -hmm. I think we often think about that as terms of vocation. Like, oh, did he call me to be just a mom, or did he call me to be a writer? Did he call me to be, you know, a doctor? Did he call me to be a, you know, cook? What did he call me to be? But I, I don't think we need to think about aspiration as in terms of our, our, our personhood. Who did he call you to be? What did he put inside of you that lights you up, that stirs your heart, that the gifts that he's called you to fan into flames? What are those inside? And I think this workshop will help you think through that because sometimes if you're in a difficult season or you've been living with a destructive person, you're not thinking about you at all other than survival mode. You're just thinking about how to stay safe. 
and your storyline is getting flatlined because you are disappearing in this relationship. Anybody feel like that? I yeah. think sometimes it's hard to know that. I like what you said earlier that sometimes other people, as with your leg, are calling attention to what you're not noticing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I'm grateful for that because we don't notice things, right? Even in our appearance, sometimes people will call attention to, hey, you've got lipstick on your teeth. You know, I, we're grateful for that, right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend who teaches you or tells you something that hinders you from looking your best or being your best. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you four questions to ask yourself, and then I'm going to ask, ask you if you have any questions. I want to ask you four questions that will help you discern the pattern if you're in a pattern of destructive relationships. So many of you are, because you are attracted to this ministry because we talk about that a lot. So if you think about your pattern in your relationship, whether it's with your family of origin, mm -hmm. whether it's with your parents, whatever the pattern is, when was the first time, whatever it was, like when was the first time you felt scared? Or when was the first time you were afraid to speak up for yourself? Or when was the first time you were put down? Or when was the first time you were hit? Or when was the first time you felt controlled by this person? Whatever it was, when was the first time? If we think about destructive behaviors as being manipulative, controlling, dismissing, minimizing, demeaning, uh, isolating. If we think about those kind of things, when was the first time, pick one, that you can relate to, if that's something you can relate to? And if not, maybe it's just difficult. When was the first time? For many of you, you're going to say, it happened on my honeymoon, the first time of something, whatever it is. Mm. The next question I want you to ask yourself is, when was the last time? So some of you have been married 15, 25, 35 years. And you might say the first time was on your honeymoon and the last time was last week or maybe last night. Yeah. When was the first time? When was the last time? What's a typical time? That's the third question. What's a typical time? What happens? in your relationship with this person that you're thinking of, where there's discernment of, is this difficult? Is this a difficult pattern? I mean, difficult relationship, or is this a destructive pattern? The first time, the last time, what's a typical time? Mm. And then the last question, and you don't have to put the answers here, they might be too personal, but what was the worst time? Those four questions will help you see a pattern. So as you're asking yourself those questions, don't answer the questions publicly because it's too, it's too public. You don't want to do that. But if you're noticing a pattern, wow, I see a pattern that he's becoming more and more scary. Or I notice a pattern that I'm becoming more and more silent and scared. What's the pattern that you're noticing? Mm. Yeah. Nettie's saying first date. I found out he lied. Yeah. yeah. I found out about three months after the first date. Yeah. That, if, when was the first time you discovered someone lying? When's the last time? What's a typical time? What's the worst time? This will help you see, wow, there is a pattern here. There is a pattern here. And if that pattern is creating more danger for you, that's important to look at. Just like my leg was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and uglier and uglier and uglier, and that was creating more danger for me, right? It wasn't getting better. It was getting worse. That let me know I've got to take action. I've got to write a new story about what I'm going to do about my leg. I'm not just going to let it happen to me because I don't want to lose my leg or I don't want to have to have half my leg, you know, skin graft or anything like that. I don't want to have to have that happen. So I get to decide. Am I going to pay attention to the pattern? It's getting worse. I like the question, what is the impact it's having on me now? Yes, what is the impact it's having on me now? Mm -hmm. 
And this is really important. I'm, I'm working on a blog for tomorrow. Some of you read my blogs. I'm working on a blog tomorrow about a woman who's married to a man who drinks too much and is abusive when he drinks too much. Definitely a pattern of destruction. And the impact on her. So so often we think that we, what's the impact of being bit by a spider on me? What's the, sometimes, it, I mean, the spider's just doing what spiders do, but the impact is great. And we're to care about ourselves too. What is the impact? Yeah, what is the impact this is having? I noticed I'm more silent even with others. Yeah, exactly. So if you're noticing things in you, you that you want to change, I would really encourage you to sign up for our new workshop. Change your story, change your life. Because if you can change you as the main character, my leg looks better today oh, yeah. than it looked last week because I took action. I did something different. Well, you wouldn't want to lose your leg. And in some of these situations, we lose who we are. Uh, I know Risa's saying, I noticed I'm more silent, even with others. You lose all of who you are mm -hmm. in a destructive pattern. And I don't trust anymore, Mandy says. Yeah, what is the impact? What is the impact? So even if something happened to you that was impacting you, Okay, so let's just do let's just do a, a story. I'm going to create a story for you, and we're going to create the ending. And I want you to show the power of you deciding. Okay, let's say that you. I'm just going to make this up right now. All right, let's say that you discover a lump on your breast, and you decide to ignore it, and you do nothing because you're too scared. And you wait for one year, two years, three years, and the lump is not going away. And finally, you go to the doctor and you find out now you have a year to live. So now you have some important decisions to make. What am I going to do? So let's say you decide that you're going to beat yourself up for ignoring that three years ago. And you're going to spend all your time mad at God, mad at yourself. Why me? Why did I wait? I'm so stupid. I can't believe this is happening to me. How does that finish out your life story? Is that a story you're proud to write? You see, so many of us get stuck in being mad at ourselves or mad at someone else. Let's take the same story. You find out that you have breast cancer, you have a year to live. And you're not happy for sure. You're not happy. A difficult thing. But what if you said to yourself, wow, I have one year to live? What matters most? How am I going to spend this year? What's most important? And you think about that and you do it. Death might be the end of your story too, but what's the legacy you left in that year? Because you decided to write it differently than just being angry and upset that this happened to you or that you didn't do anything differently three years ago. Mm -hmm. you see, we can get really caught up in anger and, and sadness over what happened to us and never move on to agency of how we're gonna write the rest of our story. And I wanna teach you how to do that in this workshop because bad things do happen to us. And they're not our fault. Sometimes they are, but most of the time they're not. All right, it's not my fault that I got bit by a spider, right? But if I had an injury because I didn't treat my leg, that would have been my fault because I didn't do anything about it. Mm. Risa, I had no idea what your same situation is, so I'm sorry it wasn't personal. It was just a story that I think happens to a lot of women is that we get stuck in anger and grief, anger that this is happening to us, anger at ourselves. Like so many women that we talk about have said to me, I've been married 40 years. I can't believe I waited this long. How could I have been so stupid? Why did I wait this long? And so now they spend the next two, three, four years just mad at themselves instead of saying, wait a minute, I'm doing something different now. What matters most now? 
I didn't know better, but now I know better and I'm going to do better. Right? And I share the story about my leg. It's, I knew better. I knew better. I knew I should have called the doctor. I just didn't because I didn't think it was that bad until it got ugly and other people said, it's that bad. Yeah. Right? And sometimes we need that perspective of others. Yeah. And so if that's you and you're saying, me, I, I want to write my part of a story differently. I can't control all the bad things that happen. But I can decide how I'm going to move my character through that story. And I am going to give you the tools to how to do that, what questions to ask, how to move through that. I just gave you four questions. When was the first time? When was the last time? What's a typical time? What's the worst time? And discovering the pattern. I'll give you some other questions in this workshop that will help you reflect so that you can change your story. And if you change your story, you change your life. Absolutely. I'm going to write the rest of my story. Yes, we can. We can write our part differently. You sure can. You may not be able to control all the variables. You may be blocked in certain ways, but you certainly have some choices. And becoming aware affords you the opportunity of thinking those through. And one of the most important things in empowerment, in, 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 in growing, is two things. Affirming, honoring your God-given dignity. You are an image bearer. You're not just an object to be used. As a woman, you are a co-created God's image bearer daughter. And you were created for purpose and value. And if you honor that, because it is yours to honor, you honor that. God gave you that. Honor that. And honor your God-given agency. You're given the right to choose. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. And sometimes we don't, like I didn't with my leg for a couple of days. So surround yourself with other wise people who will say, girl, <laughs> get yourself to the doctor. Get yourself some help. Because sometimes we are scared or we're lazy or we're not caring for ourselves well. And when we have wise people in our life who can help us, we get motivated. So I want to open it up to some questions. So I'm going to go to, if you have a question that you'd like to ask us, just put it in the chat. And if you don't want to put it in the chat because it's more personal, Karen, if you could give them a link, um, there's a link in your chat that you can ask a question on the link specifically, and then your name won't come up in the Facebook page because it's our public Facebook page. So we want to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to see if there's questions here. I'm still hearing that feedback. It's driving me crazy. Are our ladies hearing the feedback? Ladies, if you're hearing the feedback, let us know in the chat. I'm hearing like an echo. I'm hearing it on my end. I think it's me. And Evelyn's saying, I hear it once in a while. Okay. Well, as long as it's not on your end too bad, I'll, I can tolerate my end. All right. Here are our questions. What about speech and how they treat you? No conflict resolution just shuts you down. Yeah. Any thoughts about that, Diana? Well, okay. What about I was I was fixing my microphone. I changed microphones, so it, that might help. I don't know. It might have been me. Uh, what about speech and how they treat you? No conflict resolution shuts you down. Um, so I'm not sure what that means, Leslie. Um, no conflict resolution when they shut you down. Well, for me, um, there's not a whole lot you can do about that when you're when you're shut down. And um, well, well um, yeah, there's no resolution. It's a consistent pattern. And I guess, Leslie, with that, I would ask, what's the impact to me? And, and how do I want, what do I want to do with that? How do I want to write this story? Am I, am I going to continue in this pattern of being shut down and being treated poorly and not using my voice? And I think this gets really tricky for Christian women because we've been taught that men have the final say, that they have to make the decisions. And so because they're 
avoiding conflict and they're avoiding discussing anything. And because they're not willing to resolve anything, it leaves the woman in a choiceless, voiceless place where she can't, she has any power to make decisions. And so I would say to you that you can give your husband a choice. Hey, if you don't want to talk about this, then that leaves me no options but to solve the problem on my own. Instead of you being helpless and paralyzed because of his inability to resolve conflict. So how might you need to solve the problem on your own? It depends on what the conflict is. So if it's about money or money, the kids or whatever it's about, what decisions do you need to make so that you can move forward? But I don't think you have to just be a passive victim to someone else's indecision. And even, even more than that, I, I don't think you can afford to be passive and continue in this pattern because of what the cost will be to you. Not just emotionally, but physically and spiritually, it's shut down. And we can't live and thrive in shutdown mode. We were born to flourish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a couple of questions that you can ask them. And if they continue to shut you down, then what do you do? So the questions are, do you want to continue this relationship? That's a scary question, but sometimes we need to put the cards on the table. Because if you don't want to, again, giving them their choice, Okay, that's good to know, because I can't live like this. I can't, we can't, even with a roommate, when you can't talk about issues and you can't resolve conflict, it makes it very tense to live with anybody. I'm definitely sure it's my microphone. I'm echoing a lot. I think you're, whatever you change your microphone back, it's worse to the echoing now. Can you change it again? I don't know if your, your microphone is interacting with my interact, but it's more, it's worse than it was. Did you change it back? I did. Okay. I, I, I don't hear it. I don't no. hear it. No. I'm still hearing it. I'm going to have to figure out what's going on on my end. Sorry, guys. I, I checked with Karen. Oh, oh, she said it just got worse when I changed it back. Okay. So change it the other way. I'm going to go get my tech person while you answer the next question, Diane. Okay. okay. Sure thing. Okay, ladies. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to switch it to. Okay. Karen, if you could let me know in our text, if that's better now, I changed it back again. <laughs> We're having some tech issues. Oh, okay. How is it right now, Karen? And ladies, you can let me know how it is right now. Meanwhile, I'm going to don't change it. It's okay. All right. Let us know in the chat if it gets bad. We have no clue what this is. Um, I have no clue what's going on here. All righty. So I apologize for that. But our next question is great. Okay. The next question is being passive, contributing to destructive patterns. How best to do something different? Great. Okay. It seems good now. All right. Oh, it stopped because Leslie walked away, someone said. I don't know. Well, I think it did stop because I walked away. So I'm trying to get my tech person to listen and see if he can hear. Can you hear it kind of gurgling in the background? Yeah. Hold on just a minute. This one here? No. Okay. Oops. There is no arrow here. Diana, you keep talking while I'm fixing this. Okay. So is being passive contributing to destructive patterns? It can be. Absolutely. It's just, it can be destructive to you and it can be destructive to your partner. And oftentimes when you start exercising your voice, you'll get a lot of information as to whether or not I can be heard. Um, there may be some destructive patterns of behavior in response to you speaking out and not being passive any longer. Or... The other person may back off and get back in line. Um, 
So how best to do something different is practice. Practice learning what you need to speak up about and seeing what happens. Whenever you make a request from somebody, it's always more information. And so sometimes when you're asking for what you need, it can be corrective and you can be heard. And um, you can both learn new patterns and new ways of walking together. And then sometimes it can become more destructive, but that's also good information for you and will offer you the opportunity for some different choices in how you want to respond in the future. I think I didn't hear all of that, but I, I want to do answer the question as being passive, contributing to destructive patterns. I think if your husband is controlling over you and you're letting it happen, I think indirectly you're agreeing with him that you don't matter. Like your opinion, your thoughts, your feelings, your ideas don't matter. That A, a person who's passive, and maybe that's maybe. not just because... Maybe that's not just because you're married to this person, but maybe you've been passive your whole life because you were never invited to come forth. You were never invited to say, what do you think? How do you feel? What do you want? And you've just been the typical nice, good Christian girl who is accommodated and been passive and just let everybody else decide. So I think you have to kind of think through, am I okay with that? When I stand before the Lord and he says, why didn't you use your gifts and talents? And you said, what? I was afraid. Like if you don't develop you, and I'm not saying that everyone develops in the same way, but you might be more quiet or more introverted. That's fine. But if you're passive, that's more of I'm not developing me. I'm just automatically deferring to everybody else. And is that the story you want to write about your one precious life that mm -hmm. I just let everybody else decide that I was just passive in my life. And I never really decided who I was, what I wanted, what was important to me, what's not important to me, what I'm willing to fight for. And I think that, that contributes to your destruction, not to mention the destruction pattern in a relationship. And I think Christian women have been taught that that's a good thing, just to be quiet and go along. So I'm not faulting you for that, but I challenge you to rethink that. Mm -hmm. And we look at some of the women in scripture, Esther was not passive. Vashti, her predecessor was not passive. Mary was not passive. The midwives were not passive. They made decisions. I'm not doing what the Pharaoh says. I'm not going to kill those baby Jews. Right? God never, Proverbs 31 woman was not passive. April, Aqu uh, Priscilla and Aquila, she was not passive. And so we look at women who are held up in scripture. Ruth was not passive. Tamar was not passive. She took agency and she, she was kind of shrewd actually. And so I think when we look at women in the scriptures, we, we see women who took action on their own behalf and on the behalf of others and didn't stay passive. So what's it cost you to stay passive? I think sometimes it's easier to stay passive um, because it may seem like it's keeping the peace, but that's a great question. At what cost? Mm -hmm. The cost is high. And is it really keeping the peace by not talking about anything? It's, it's, a, it's a fake peace. It's a fake, it's a truce. Hey, we'll agree to live together and we'll not talk about anything hard. But then you live sort of a skim milk existence. There's no real substance to your life, right? Is that what you want? And again, it's your story. I'm not here to judge your story. But it's your story. It's your one precious life story. How do you want to live it? Suppressing is a good word, Leslie. And when I think about that, um, being passive about destructive behaviors um, is 
a shutting down of yourself. And you cannot shut down just yourself. You know me, I, I like to talk even about the physical self. And I don't think it's just, it's, it's a shutting down of yourself spiritual, spiritually. And of course, we know emotionally, but also physically. And you know, as we know, um, in uh, our famous, um, the famous book, The Body Keeps the Score, you know, your body will start telling you you're shutting down. Because as I said, we were meant to flourish and live authentically in terms of who we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would just encourage you to kind of think about that. Like, what's my passivity costing me? And what have I been taught about my own needs and voice? And we're not even talking about conflict. We're just talking about saying, I like pizza, or I don't like shrimp, or I like purple, and I want cotton sheets. Do you know that? Or are you just passive? And you just take what everybody offers. My husband says that I'm the abuser in the relationship. This has caused me major struggles with my identity. Can there be two abusers in marriage? marriage? We both come from traumatic backgrounds. I think so. I think there can be two abusive people in a marriage. Um, the Bible tells us in Galatians, stop biting and devouring yeah. each other, lest you will destroy each other. So I don't know that you're the abuser, but I would ask him, what behaviors do you see from me that feel abusive to you? And I think those are the same questions I hope he would ask you. And then reflect on that, whether it's true. Because some men will, one, I'm, I'm almost hesitant to talk because of this feedback. I'm not sure what's going on. But it's almost as if once you set boundaries, sometimes the, you're not passive anymore. Your abuser will accuse you of being abusive because now you have your no. But it's not abusive to have a no. It's human. You're not able to have a full yes unless you have a full no. Alien says, I want to be whole milk, even heavy cream. I do too. So milk existence is not for me either. Don't like it. Yeah. So to the person who's written this question about we both come from traumatic backgrounds, I just encourage you to do your work. Do your work. Whatever that is. Right? Do your work. If you've come from a traumatic background, do your work to heal. How do I distinguish between needing self-care mm -hmm. due to trauma and finding the balance between needing rest but still making choices that move forward in life and divorce? That's a really good question for you, Diana. Okay. And meanwhile, I think Leanne put something in the chat. She thinks you might have two microphones on. I don't know how that's possible. Yeah, Maybe I don't think so. My, okay. my husband's out looking at something to work on. All right. So um, where are we at here? How do I distinguish between needing self-care due to trauma and finding the balance between needing rest but still making choices that move forward? I think you work at your own pace um, and you get some help for understanding where your trauma is influencing your life and how it's affecting your relationships. And um, you listen to your body and you take the time that you need. You know, you can't work on your trauma 24 seven and you can't stay in destructive 24 seven. So we need to pace ourselves and we do take steps forward but we need to take time and give ourselves care. Um, and so that would be taking steps to help you move forward in life and divorce because as you do your own work all of your relationships external to you are going to be, they're, they're going to, you're going to have developed some insight and awareness 
about how they are impacting you and how your story is impacting your relationships. So a part of really rewriting your story is understanding some of those stories in the past that may be contributing to your pain. And so it's all good. Um, but listening to yourself and not letting other people tell you what you need. I, I took two naps today. My daughter called me and she said, she's in grad school. She's like, mom, am I horrible? Because I slept till three o'clock today. And then she told me we were up till four. They're both going, um, her and her and her guy are both going through. And I said, no, sweetie. I said, I took two naps today. I was listening to my body. I did a little bit of work um, and then took a 20 minute nap, but you need to pace yourself. Um, this is a journey. And self-care isn't just rest. It's also moving forward. So I wouldn't say there's a, there's a distinction. Self-care is saying I need time to rest and I need time to stimulate my brain and be creative and learn new things. And it's both and. So it's not self-care and then do work. It's both is, is self-care, just different types of self-care. I've been divorced for several years from a destructive relationship. I want to move forward and have a new life, but it's not easy to see the signs. How do I protect myself if I start a new relationship? I would separate two things from having a new life to a new relationship. I would really encourage you to start a new life and build friendships, build interests, build yourself to understand who you are, what you love, what you don't love, all of those kind of things so that you get as healthy as possible before you ever invest in a new romantic relationship. Because if you're trying to build a life by finding the right person, um, that makes you vulnerable to being dependent on them to build your life. I'd like you to build your life the way you want it to. And then a man who fits into that will be just right for you. A man who you're depending on to build your life is still an unhealthy dynamic. You want to take the next one, Diana? Sure thing. How do you deal with a spouse that refuses to discuss betrayal after initial apology, asking for forgiveness and promises to change? He says he's not avoiding accountability because he's acknowledging what he's done, but doesn't want to live in the past. And my, I'm sorry, but this is, this is pretty typical. Uh, live in the past and my negativity will prevent a good future for us. He says talking through things is what my counselor is for. Um, I don't know about how to deal with the spouse. I think the first thing that I would say to that is that refusing to discuss the impact of what he's done to you and what the betrayal has cost not only you, but the relationship, your ability to trust and the marriage is not a promise to change. And so there's some information there in terms of really what he's willing to do and what he's not willing to do. It, for me, uh, indicates a premature um, sense of remorse and repentance that doesn't have much depth to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, what will you do with that information? I don't believe trust can be reestablished if those steps aren't fully explored. And so um, you say you have a counselor, and I think this is a great thing to discuss with your counselor. How will you move forward if the past is never reconciled? The deeper issue that I see here is that he's not showing concern for you, for the impact that he's caused you. So it's like, oh, you get that taken care of over there because I don't want to feel bad, right? It's, it's basically talking to you about how I hurt you makes me feel bad. So you do that with your counselor because I don't want to feel bad. Your negativity makes me feel bad. And to me, that mindset is a selfish heart. There's a real selfishness to that. That also fueled his entitlement to cheat on you. So just because he's saying, I'm sorry, I cheated on you and I won't do that again, 
I'm not sure I would believe that because the heart is still selfish. It was all about him. I need something. I, I want something. I'm going to take something, even though it's going to hurt my wife. And now that it's hurt my wife, I don't want to hear about it. Just forgive me and we'll be fine. And because that bothers me that we talk about it. And so there's this bottom line of self-centered selfishness in his persona that I don't think he's truly seen yet enough of to repent of. Um, it's not just about the affair. It's about me and what I feel and what I want. And those two things seem to be always at the top of his list. So I want to cheat. I'm going to do it regardless of its impact on you. Now that I want you back, I want you back, but I don't want to talk about it regardless of its impact on you. So it's the same mindset that's going in both places. Um, so I don't think there's a deep enough, I'm not saying his repentance over cheating isn't genuine, but I don't think his repentance is deep enough to elicit real change. All right, I had to go to the cops because of ongoing abuse, but my son-in-law, by my son-in-law toward his children due to bipolar. I don't think so. My daughter covers up for him at the expense of her children. After a few incidents of mistreatment by my granddaughter, I asked why she was treating me horrible. She said, it makes my mommy and daddy happy to be mean to you. Sad. And you're right, it's sad. How can I have a relationship with my granddaughters, three and two? Three, three granddaughters, when two of them have voiced the same quote. I always had a terrific relationship with them. Should I even have a relationship with them? Holidays, birthdays. Wow. Wow. So I have a couple thoughts. I think you did the right thing. Um, but unfortunately, if the mom isn't going to stand up for her kids and she's going to side with her husband or cover things up, um, it is going to cost her kids. I think you have to decide if you want to have a good relationship with granddaughters, but having a good relationship with your granddaughters requires you to be honest with them. Hey, it may make your mommy and daddy happy to be mean to me. Does it make you happy to be mean to me? Because you're being mean to me right now and I don't like it. So I think those are the, the opportunities that you have to be a good influence on your grandchildren to say, I don't like being talked to like that. I love you very much, but I won't be talked to that way. That's not, that's not the way you talk to your grandma. I would say that to my grandchildren, and I hope you would stick up for yourself and say that to your grandchildren. And if it makes you happy to make someone else sad, then then I would be really concerned about their welfare. You know, and I would just say that, hey, why would it make you happy to hurt someone? Why would it make you happy to make someone else sad? That's not the way God wants us to be. And so I think you have an opportunity to be an influence on them, especially if their home is very toxic, but with boundaries with boundaries. Any thoughts, Diana? Uh, not, not for that last day. I think you covered it well. I, I think the question is, should I even have a relationship with them? I mean, and that's, you get to make those choices. I always think um, that just depends on how painful it is. And are my bound, you know, once when I use my voice and I declare my boundaries, what do I get now? And, um, you know, that's a personal choice, but it certainly would be okay if you choose not to expose yourself to further pain and degradation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think to even, I don't know how old your grandchildren are. They're maybe just copying their parents. And so if they're young enough, I think you can still be an influence on them to say, I would love to spend time with you. I would love to spend time with you, but not when you talk to me that way. So, yeah. Diana, you want to read that? Sure. How do you respond to your husband if he threatens to divorce all the time and then claims that he wants the marriage? He doesn't even invest in the marriage. Well, it sounds to me like there might be a little bit of manipulation occurring here. Um, and I might ask him, I might just simply say to him, you know, I hear you threatening to divorce me quite often. And then I also hear you saying that you want the marriage. I'm not sure what it is. And, um, ask him, you know, is he in or is he out? And, um, you know, for me, Leslie, I'm a little blunt. I might just call this bluff. <laughs> I might just call this bluff and say, you know, you can choose one way or the other but you can't have both. 
And I might even ask them another question, like, what does it mean to have a marriage? Because you say you want the marriage. What, what does that mean to you? Because you said he doesn't invest in the marriage. So does he say, is he really saying, I'm going to divorce you because you don't do what I want unless you do what I want. And if you do everything I want, then I want you. <laughs> so his idea of marriage is that you are the Stepford wife. You have sex when I want. You clean the house when I want. You make the dinner I want. You're available when you want. You leave me alone when I want. And if you do all those things, of course I want the marriage. But if you have anything that you're asking of me, no way. And if you keep doing that, I'm going to divorce you. So it sounds like it's a very immature view of marriage that you're to be here to be my servant, my plaything, my companion, my financial helper when I want it and leave me alone when I don't. And so I would just kind of challenge, what is your idea of marriage? You want the marriage. What does that look like for you? And then decide whether that's okay for you. you. Mm -hmm. There was a question I just saw below. Uh, it says, Leslie said she would give us four questions. And then I only had one question. I gave four questions earlier to discover the pattern. And I'll, I'll repeat them. So the four questions, if you think you might be in a pattern of a destructive marriage or a destructive relationship, is these four questions. When was the first time? whatever happened, the first time he scared you, the first time he sexually abused you, the first time he called you names, whatever you're concerned about what destructive behavior is, when was the first time it happened? When was the last time it happened? What's a typical time? And what was the worst time? Those would be the four questions to discover the pattern. Okay. Eighty-nine-year-old manipulative father that's undermined, sabotaged, and does everything to displace me in the family. He's dishonest, destructive, vindictive, controls the narrative. Do I just walk away? Wow. No, that really is a destructive pattern, isn't it? He's had 89, well, you haven't been with him 89 years, but he's had 89 years for an opportunity to change. And all of these behaviors, wow. Um, you certainly could. You certainly could just walk away. Yeah. And what would that be like for you if you took control of that story and no longer allowed that to come into your life, into your heart? And, you know, Leslie, I'm just assuming at this point that this person has already maybe used her voice, maybe asked for what she needed, maybe tried everything that you could in that relationship. Um, and yet this continues. I would not choose to, personally, I would not choose to stay in a destructive relationship, regardless of the relate, uh, regardless of who that person was in my life. I would choose me. And that, and that may sound a bit selfish at times to some of you, but I had to make that decision with my mother that I could not have a relationship with my mother because it didn't have the essential ingredients of trust, safety, honesty, respect, all those basics. However, what I could do, and this is how I changed the narrative, I could have ministry on my terms with good boundaries so that I could feel like I was being a good daughter, I'm honored, my parent, when she needed help, I could, I could take her to the doctor. I could, you know, do something for her without any expectations of her thanking me, no relationship. I didn't expect any, you know, praise. So I think that empowered you to say, I can write my side of the story. And it might be that I don't see her. It might be that we don't have a relationship. And I didn't see her for a number of years because I had to get some healthiness before I could even do the next step. But what I'm saying is, saying is we can't control the narrative they create. But you can be more active in creating your own narrative of how you are going to show up in this bad story. Are you going to show up as the victim? Or are you going to show up as the heroine? Not to rescue them, but to rescue you. If we think about stories where there's a bad guy, oftentimes the bad guy doesn't convert to the good guy. 
the thing that we like about the story where the bad guy and the good guy is the good guy finally got away from the bad guy. Or the good guy finally stood up to the bad guy. Or the good guy finally made his own life and made his own way, even though the bad guy was still the bad guy. And we're applauding because he took charge of his narrative, his story. And so I would encourage you to do that. You know, this this guy sounds like he's he's pretty solid. <laughs> he's pretty solidly destructive. But I wouldn't I would also say for some people, stepping away from certainly familiar family relationships or even friendships for a while and just getting quiet and creating some distance might be a wake up call for them. It it may be a wake up call for them. And I've certainly experienced that in my life when um, I've opened the door um, to the to that relationship again, the dynamics are different and they've learned that I will no longer tolerate that behavior. But you have to wait and see and try that out. Mm -hmm. All right, before we take the last couple of questions, what I'd love for you to do in, right now is put in the chat, what has been your biggest aha moment from attending? Because for all of you, it's going to be different. But for you, what what was your main takeaway? And put it in the chat. What do you see? Michelle is putting in the chat, I like that question. I'm not sure what question she, she's speaking of. So Michelle, maybe you can put that out there. Uh, what does it mean to have a marriage? There you go. What does it mean to have a marriage? Mm -hmm. What's been your biggest takeaway? Protecting this one life that we have. Yeah. I am whole milk, not skim milk. I am worth the calories. <laughs> Love that. You flourish in your one beautiful life. Be the heroine of your story. Yeah. What else? What else? These patterns have been years and years in the making. Yeah, we control our own narrative. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to be you, Evelyn said. I love that. Yeah. Recognizing our own destructive patterns for not taking self-care. Mm -hmm. But I need to choose to get healthier and live my values. Yeah. Yeah. Being honest with yourself and realizing your self-worth. Hmm. What is being passive costing me? Really good mm -hmm. insights. Really Absolutely. good insights. We're going to answer two more questions. Um, I'm going to get my mic fixed for tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to be back by myself. And we're going to be talking about self-hatred and bitterness. What is that costing you? And how do you let go of it? Our self-hatred, because sometimes once we start to see all this stuff, like we start to see our passivity or we start to see, you know, our compliance or whatever it is, we just get really upset with ourselves, really mad at ourselves. And we get stuck in that story for a long time. So we want to learn how to bring it to that place. Yeah. So Diana, you want to pick one more question and I'll pick one? Sure. Okay. Mercy, this is one. Okay, this is a, this is a big one. How do you heal from a marriage that has been full of lies and deceit? My husband says that he is gay and that he doesn't want to be with me anymore. We have four children and I'm devastated. 
But any time that I try to talk to him about it, he says that I'll never understand because I'm not affirming of Christian same-sex relationships. He has tried to pressure me into having an open marriage so he can be himself. I have said no, and so I'm treated like the enemy. He refuses to leave the house because he wants to be able to find a way to have his children and have the other life too. Hmm. Well, I, I say it starts with you. Healing from a marriage that's been full of lies starts with acknowledging the truth and telling yourself the truth, not living by his truth. He's trying to create the narrative here that he wants moving forward. But what is your truth? And it sounds to me like setting some boundaries about what's okay with you and what's not okay with you. I mean, he says he wants, boy, his, his destructive requests are, if, if, if you, if you, if you give in to his destructive requests, what will that cost you, even spiritually? Mm. What will that cost the children? So in terms of healing, the first step is to tell yourself the truth. And to really identify what it is you're willing to say yes to and what you're willing to not say yes to. What do you think, Leslie? Yeah, I think that to say to him, just because I don't agree with you doesn't mean... I mean, I think there's yeah. some humility here to say... Yeah. We don't know everything about everything, and I'm sorry that you are in a bad situation. To have empathy, you're in a bad situation. You don't feel sexually attracted to women. You want to act out with men. Not only is that against my values as a Christian, it's against my values as a person to have an open marriage. I'm not willing to have an open marriage with you sleeping with another woman, let alone sleeping with another man. I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to lie, and I'm not willing to pretend everything is okay. So do you want to tell the children or do you want us to tell the children together? Or do you want me to tell the children, but I'm not willing to live like this. And I think that's the choice you have. He has choices about what he's doing and he's saying, and he's trying to manipulate you into feeling guilty or pressured to do what he wants or to comply with what he wants. You don't have to, but that you have to understand it's gonna create a new story. And it doesn't mean it's gonna be a bad story, but it's a sad story for sure for a season for a season and um, he's going to treat you however he's going to treat you. You can't control that. People treated Jesus like the enemy. Okay. You just can have boundaries around that so that they don't have access to you. And that's where boundaries come in to protect yourself. He, 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 okay. He is not willing to have an honest conversation. This is a one way dialogue where he is kind of flipping the narrative to get his way. And so as a part of healing, I might stop trying to have that conversation. I might just start making some decisions about what's best for, for you and the four children. They're being exposed to all this as well. This is, you know, this is what they will be witnessing and what they see. Hmm. And some of the other questions that we have unanswered kind of all relate to the same thing is our desire to get him to see, our desire to get him to change, our desire to get him to stop, <laughs> our desire to get him to do something different, to talk to us, to resolve conflict, to all of those kind of things. And I think one of the things that you're hearing, I'm oh, sorry, my mic is, something's wrong. I'm going to have to get it fixed tomorrow, but something um I think what you're hearing is you can't change the side of the street. You can only change your side of the street. You cannot change their side of the street. You can only change your side of the street. And so let me answer this final question because this is the way you change your side of the street. Okay. How do you handle one where you set boundaries on saying unkind things to you and they think it's funny? This similar question, how do you handle enabling in-laws when we're divorcing that blame you for not loving their son after he had an affair? Both of these questions involve how do I control them? You can't control them. Jesus was told he was demon-possessed. Jesus was called crazy. You're out of your mind. 
He was called a charlatan. He didn't waste any time trying to convince them they were wrong. So my friend, if you can know who you are and live in your true self, not everybody's going to like it, especially if they're used to controlling you the way they were used to controlling you or putting you down or micromanaging you. And so if you need, with a capital N-E-E-D, everyone's approval in order for you to be okay, then that's your work to do so that you don't need that, so that you can have boundaries and set boundaries. But I'm going to give some specifics here for this last question. How do you handle one where you set boundaries on saying unkind things to you and they think it's funny? So the problem with this boundary is you're setting it on them and not on you. You can't control what someone thinks, right? I can, I can say to my publisher, here's my manuscript, and they can think it's a bad book. I can't control what they think. I can be on Facebook Live with you, and you can think I'm being unbiblical. I can't control what you think. And so as long as we think we have to control what they think, we're going to be driving ourselves crazy. You can't control what they think. So let me ans answer the question. How do you handle one where you set boundaries on saying unkind things to you and they think it's funny? Of course they're going to think it's funny. They're going to mock you so that you don't do it. But you can't set boundaries on someone else. The only thing you can set boundaries on is what you can control. So here's how you might say it. I don't like it when you say unkind things. Please stop. Now that's not a boundary. That's a request. They dishonor your request. They make fun of you. They think it's funny. Ha, 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 ha. I'm going to, you know, say unkind things. When you continue to talk to me like that, and I'm not saying you would say these words, but this is what you need to do. I am going to set a boundary. I am removing access to myself. I am not going to be in your presence when you say unkind things to me anymore. So as soon as you start to do that, if you're not going to re respect my no, then my boundary is I'm not going to be in your company. The same would be true if someone was smoking and they were blowing smoke in your face right? And you say, please stop smoking. I don't like secondhand smoke. And they say, no, <laughs> I'm going to blow smoke in your face. I think it's funny. Mm -hmm. What do you do? The boundary isn't on them. The boundary is on you. I'm not driving with you. I'm not going in the car with you. I'm not staying in the house with you. I'm not living with you. Whatever the boundary might be, that the only person you can set a boundary on is how much access you give them to you. Your boundary is shutting the door. You don't have access to me if you treat me that way and not please stop trust, you know, we can ask them to stop treating you that way. Stop blowing smoke in my face. And most people, if you ask them, they will stop. They won't make fun of you. But if they do make fun of you, that's a red flag that you are not respected and you are not treated like an equal partner here. And you need to at least respect and honor yourself by taking care of yourself and removing yourself from the situation. Just like, We've talked about this before, but you don't give everybody access to your ATM card. Why? Because they would take advantage of you and spend your money, and then you wouldn't have any money left for yourself, and then you'd be all upset, right? So you don't give everyone your passwords, and you don't give everyone a card and say, here's my code and take what you want. But yet we have a boundary. No, I'm going to be generous, but I'm not going to give you access to my bank account. In the same way, you don't give someone access to your presence, to your mental ability, to your heart. The Bible tells you, guard your heart above all else, for it is the wellspring of life. But if you're giving someone access to your heart, and then they trample it, like Jesus says, don't keep casting your pearls before swine, lest they turn on you and trample you with it. And yet you keep saying, please love me, please care about me, please respect my no, please honor me. And they're going, <laughs> no. Yeah. It's time for you to say, I'm not giving you any more access to me. Not why aren't they changing? They're not changing because they don't want to. Honor their no, and now you start having a no. No access to me because you don't treat me right. And that may change the narrative quite a bit for you. And it's scary. It's scary because you might lose the good part of the relationship, whatever that is. But if the relationship is difficult, then think about that. If the relationship is destructive, no good part of a destructive relationship is worth enduring the destructive part. No good part, the love bombing, great sex, whatever it is that the good part is, he's, he pays all the bills, whatever the good part of the destruction is, is it worth the cost of enduring all the bad part? Mm -hmm. 
Only you can decide that. But now that echo went away. Did you do anything different with your mic, Diana? I did. It was me. Okay. I had, I had an external speaker that was that was um, echoing. It was a Bose speaker instead of my computer. So it's it's me. I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Whatever it was, I, I heard a difference in the background. I'm thinking, okay, something happened. So I hope this was helpful to you. If you have not signed up for our workshop, we invite you to do that. Uh, we will be doing it live on December 5th at noon Eastern time as well as 730 Eastern time. If you've been a part of our workshops before, you know they are high value. You know they are high quality that we talk about an hour. I'm going to be talking. I'm going to give you specific uh, help on how to rewrite your story for 2024 and move from breakdown to breakthrough. How specifically do you do that? I'm going to give you some steps. I'm going to give you some questions to ask yourself. I'm going to give you some things that you can begin to turn the page this year and begin to write a new chapter to your life story about who you really are and develop the woman that God called you, made you, and desires you to be. That is your calling. It's not just your role as a wife or mom. It's not, you might be a wife and a mom, but what kind of wife and what kind of mom are you going to be? Are you just going to default to what everyone tells you to be? Or are you going to do the work so that you are the one that God calls you to be? You know, when God called Peter, Peter was a mess. And Peter was writing his story as a fisherman. When God called Gideon, Gideon was a weenie little farmer from the tribe of Benjamin. He was, he saw himself as a nobody. And yet God saw him as potential. I know who you are, Gideon. I know who I made you to be. Peter, I know who you are, Peter. I know who I made you to be. And yet Peter didn't feel it and Gideon didn't feel it. But God saw them and he talked to them in the presence tense. Remember the story? He says, Peter, you are the rock. He didn't say someday you will be the rock. Right when Peter was just the fisherman making all kinds of bumbling mistakes, he said, you are the rock. To Gideon, who wasn't yet, or at least he wasn't yet feeling like it, what he would become, Gideon's story. He said, Gideon, you're a warrior. I made you to be the warrior. Now go act like it. You see, Gideon had to write a different story, but he couldn't have written a different story if he didn't believe who God said he was. Did he feel like it? No, but he grew into it. And so I want to teach you about how to do that so that you don't get stuck in breakdown. We all go through breakdown. We just don't want to stay stuck there too long. And so come back tomorrow because I'm going to talk about self-hatred because one of the things that happens when we start realizing, oh my gosh, I've wasted so much time being accommodating, being passive, being the good girl, being nice, or being angry and bitter and resentful. And then we get so full of self-hatred that we get stuck in there for a while because Satan will do anything to ruin our story. And so I'm going to teach you tomorrow how to move beyond that self-hatred and bitterness that we get toward ourselves or even toward God for allowing things to happen in our life. How do we move beyond that so that that doesn't become the end of the story? It, it's a season of story, but we want to move beyond that so we get past that into the real juicy part of our life story. All right. So hope you show up tomorrow. We'll be at the same place on Facebook Live as well as um YouTube, and I will be doing, since I'll be by myself, I think I'm going to try to go live on Instagram at the same time, which is a real challenge for me since I'm not technical, but now I think I can do it. And so we're going to do all three channels tomorrow, see where we go from there. So I will see you tomorrow. Thanks so much, Diana. I'm glad we got that solved. Absolutely. I just want to say before we go, this workshop is for everyone, regardless of where you are in your life. And what re if you're in a relationship, this is for you. And if you want to create a different story moving forward, this is a this is a great opportunity to gain some tools. And if you're not in a relationship, this is for you. Because so many women think their story ends at the end of a relationship and it doesn't begin again until they get a new relationship. And that's not true. That's not true. So and if you're not in a relationship, this this workshop is for you. Absolutely. And I see from our chat that many of you are talking about relationships with your children, relationships with your parents. And so, yes, this is for you. So we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Take care. Thanks so much, Diana. Absolutely. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.